go ahead and get started. I know we still will have some people dribbling in over the next two few minutes, but that's absolutely fine. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful April evening. It's feeling more and more like we're closer to the end of the year. For those that don't know me, my name is Amy Thompson. I am the College and Career Counselor here at Hillsborough High School. Let me just give you the lay of the land about what's going to happen tonight. Um, first, our very fabulous guests will be introducing themselves, telling you who they are, this institution that they re represent, and a little bit about each of their schools. And then we'll move on into kind of the Q&A portion of the evening. Um, we do have um, existing questions that we've already got put together that are compiled from me, from you all who have submitted questions, and we'll be working with those. Um, if you do have other questions that come up throughout the evening, the Q&A functionality at the bottom of Zoom is active, so you can ask questions there. We'll do our best to get to those or incorporate them into the other questions that we're asking, or if it's institution specific, that representative will do their best to answer that when they can. But we do not have kind of like a backstage crew of extra people answering questions, so it's just us here. Um, so we will do our best to get to everything. Um, before we do get started, I just wanted to get a quick sense of what grade levels we have represented here today. So if you could just take a second, answer that on your screen. Just want to kind of see where we're at, if we're predominantly juniors or pred predominantly underclassmen. That helps as we answer questions and kind of know maybe how in depth to go on, on certain things. And it does so far. I'm, wa I'm watching the numbers go up here, everyone. Um, we are in good shape. Um, we are about two thirds juniors, one third everybody else. So just to kind of give you an idea about where we're at tonight. So with no further delay, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Gettysburg University. Hello everyone, my name is Kate Guy and I'm one of the Northern New Jersey representatives here for Gettysburg College. Um, excited to say that we are a nationally ranked highly selective residential college of the liberal arts and sciences with a strong alumni network of 32,000 graduates who are making a difference in a variety of different career fields. Uh, our highest priority is to provide our 2400 undergraduate students coming from 40 different countries and 40 different states with a consequential education that provides a rigorous education and opportunities to become a transformative leader in society. Uh, we focus on a breadth and depth approach to our education. Uh, so our students are dipping their paintbrush into a variety um, to all of the departments on our campus as they pursue their education here. And in our classrooms, we're also focusing on a set of enduring skills so that our students can not only thrive in their first job, but for any job that they pursue after graduations. Um, our students are engaging with our expert faculty members as they pursue these high impact experiences like hands-on research, internships, and global education and community service. Um, living on a beautiful campus in one of the nation's most historically important towns, our students have access to major cities like Baltimore, Maryland, Washington, DC, as they strive to do great, great work and advance their communities, our nation and the world. Hi. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Katie Matan. I am missions counselor at Lehigh University. Uh, Lehigh is located in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, so about an hour, hour 15 minutes from y'all. Um, but we're a mid sized institution. Uh, we have about 5,600 undergrads, about 1,600 graduate students. So, all in all, about 7,000 students on our campus. Um, we are a research based institution. Um, and being a university, we do have four undergraduate colleges that comprise the university. So, we have our College of Arts and Sciences, our College of Business, our PC Rawson College of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and then our fairly newer College of Health. Um, so, when you apply to Lehigh, you will apply to one of those four undergraduate colleges. Um, again, we are a research-based institution. It does not mean you have to do research, but one of the unique things about Lehigh is that as an 18-year-old first-year undergrad student, you are able to step in and do that research right away. So having that um, that community base, that collaboration with faculty and staff is something that Lehigh truly values. Um, you are also a part of, you know, the, uh, the Lehigh Valley, which is uh, the third largest metro area in Pennsylvania next to Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. So again, we're about an hour from Philadelphia, hour and a half on a really good day from New York City. So you have um, those really, you know, two large cities to be able to network with Lehigh alum, to be able to do intern 
internships to to find those jobs uh, post graduation from Lehigh. Um, I would say extracurriculars are a really important part of a Lehigh experience. So getting involved, whether it's clubs, community services, internships, study abroad, all of the above are, are a part of that experience. Um, we have about 85,000 plus Lehigh alum um, and are gracious enough to come back as much as they can to talk to our students in our colleges, but also really try and connect with current students and allow them to see that postgraduate success. Um, one of our our true values and, and a statistic we truly pride ourselves on is 97 percent of our class of 2022 are either employed in post-grad school doing some sort of military or work or volunteer work all within six months of graduation uh, and that percentage has stayed within 95 to 97 percent for the past two decades um, and that consistently stayed through COVID as well so um, that's that's what being a Lehigh student is about um, so excited to get to chat with you and answer all your questions uh, tonight. Next up, we have Purdue, and I know at least one person has said they're not seeing video. I don't know if anybody else is um, or if it's a universal problem, but I am kind of working on it. Hi, everyone. This is Zainab. I am located in Edison, New Jersey. I'm the regional for um, Purdue admissions in Pens um, Pennsylvania and Jersey, so I cover both of these regions, and I live locally, so fellow New Jersey person here. And um, I'm talking about Purdue today. Uh, we're basically located in um, two hours away from Chicago, one hour away from Indianapolis. So we're located in India, Indiana. Um, it's your typical huge Midwestern campus. Um, a total enrollment is about 50,000 students. Um, we are the top three schools for um, sororities and fraternities so it's typical I, I like to say that it's your typical movie like campus <laughs> Purdue a main campus and West Lafayette and um, we have about 250 plus majors we're a huge research-based institution like the university and um, we our most popular majors are all of our engineering so I'll and, and to discuss that basically I'll just say first year engineering for um, admission purposes um, computer science, our third most popular major is um, professional flight. So if you want to become a professional pilot, you graduate with your license and you can fly for any major career upon graduation. It's very competitive because of spaces and our fourth most popular major is nursing. Other than that, um, we're really popular in the areas of aeronautical, NASA um, related research, as well as multiple government contracts we work on and tons of research happening in College of Science. Overall, um, because we are a huge university, we have 11 colleges and um, there's a lot of room to overlap between colleges. So if you wanna do a major minor option, double major across colleges, that's certainly a possibility at Purdue. Um, we have something called degree in three years. We also do an early summer start. So tons of non-traditional options available for students who want to pursue more than one thing or if you, they wanna graduate early. We also have about 150 programs in over 50 countries for study abroad, experiential learning. We're big on hands-on learning. So just like Lee University, we are also doing research um, freshman year. So as soon as you come in as a Purdue student, um, by the end of your first semester, you are on your way to your first internship. And we have an amazing, amazing co-op opportunity in most of our colleges. And some of our highest paying salaries are coming out from the finance department because of their co-op program. So that's a fun fact. Other than that, um, tuition is frozen for almost 11 plus years now. So we are one of the affordable options out there. Um, again, um, if you have a chance, definitely visit in person. But we have an amazing, amazing on online um, video tutorial that's available for you to learn more about it. Excited to be here. so much and I hopefully I fixed the video I tinkered with some things um so if anyone wants to give me an update on whether or not they can see the video that would be great um and next up I have Bryce all right hello everybody my name is Sarah Jin I'm the admission counselor um, overseeing New Jersey for Rice University in Houston Texas I'm also a Rice alum so I am clearly very passionate about Rice but um, for those of you who aren't familiar Rice is an R1 research university located in Houston Texas I think I might be the furthest away from y'all, geographically speaking, here today. But um, at Rice, we have seven schools of study, architecture, business, engineering, humanities, music, 
natural science and social sciences. And um, our academics are very strong um, across all of these schools of study. We also have a flexible distribution system in which students don't have a core um, requirement. They take three courses each in humanities, social sciences, and STEM in order to fulfill that kind of breadth requirement. And um, like some of the other universities here today, we have experiential learning for students as early as their very first year, whether that's research, internships, or hands-on classroom experiences. And typically more than two thirds of our student body will conduct research before they graduate. Rice is also characterized by our very vibrant student life. We're consistently ranked at the top for happiest students um, and number four for best quality of life. So the um, residential college system at Rice is a little bit unique. We have um, these 11 residential colleges that are the core of student life and they're where students eat, live and engage in government and sports. And students are randomly assigned to these residential colleges and they remain a member of them throughout their four years. So there isn't a engineering college or an athletes college. All of these colleges are a microcosm of Rice themselves and it creates a diverse and supportive community of peers, of faculty and staff and of alumni. Um, we also have 300 plus student clubs and counting uh, that cover interests from academic to volunteer to special interests to cultural. And we have about 14 uh, NCAA D1 teams that also compete in the Conference USA. Um, Houston is also a big part of the Rice experience. Uh, Houston is the fourth largest city in the nation, soon to be the third. And we're also the most culturally and ethnically diverse city in the country, which I did not know before attending Rice. And there are over 145 languages spoken across uh, Houston residents. And Rice has a lot of programs for that encourages students to engage with the museums, with the food, with the performing arts, and with the sports throughout the city. Rice is also unique in our um, financial aid offerings. So we cover 100% of demonstrated financial need through grant aid. Um, we are a loan-free school for fairly recently. And um, any gap between what a student is able to afford and what the cost of tuition is, Rice is committed to meeting that for all of our domestic students. And um, these are awarded through the Office of Financial Aid. And uh, typically we'll see students go into fields such as technology, healthcare, consulting, and higher education. And um, similar to some of my colleagues here today, we have over 95% of our students every year working in industry or in graduate school. So hope you get a chance to engage with us further. Thanks so much. Next up our neighbors at Rutgers. Yeah, Sarah just said she's coming from the furthest. I think I'm coming from the closest. Not only that, I'm Zooming from Somerset County. So I'm right here with you. My name is Suzanne Schaefer. I'm coming to you from Rutgers University, New Brunswick. Um, I just wanna give you a quick overview. Many of you already know that Rutgers is the State University of New Jersey. The New Brunswick campus is the flagship State University campus. We're the biggest. Um, Rutgers was founded in 1766. Some people don't know that. We were one of the original colonial colleges, making us one of the oldest schools in the country. Uh, we have 37,000 undergraduates. Rutgers is not a small place, um, but their students are, part, are studying in over 120 majors in 11 colleges. They're participating in 750 clubs and organizations, playing on one of the 24 D1 Big Ten sports, like my Purdue friend. Um, they're studying abroad, they're conducting research at one of our rec 175 research institutes. So there's a lot going on at Rutgers when, when big opportunities for a big school, but it doesn't mean that you're going to find everything to be big. Actually, 60% of our classes are under 30 students. So classes can get very small very quickly. Um, one of the ways we make the school a little smaller is our 11 colleges, seven of which first year students can apply to. So if you're undecided, you're not really sure, it's a great place to start arts and sciences. But if you have some specific ideas that what you want, we've got places like school of business, engineering, um, specific direct entry nursing and pharmacy programs, um, school of environmental and biological sciences and I am missing one. Um, oh, Mesa Grove School of the Arts. <laughs> so I can't forget them. Um, and, you know, I do encourage you to come visit. We um, have tours available on for all of our neighborhood campuses. Rutgers is laid out a little bit differently from almost any other campus that you'll be to come to visit. Um, so tours will be available starting again in June. Um, and we'll hope to see you on campus. And I look forward to answering your questions. Samantha.
can see me. Uh, hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Samantha Murray, and I am the regional representative for the University of South Carolina. I recruit in the entire state of New Jersey and eastern Pennsylvania, which is where I currently reside. Um, I have been at the University of South Carolina for a little over two years, and it has been a blast. Uh, a little bit of information, if you're not already familiar, we are the state flagship for the great state of South Carolina, and we are located in Columbia, South Carolina. Columbia is arguably more of a suburban city than a city um, that you are all used to. I joke that it is the complete opposite of a city of uh, like Houston or Manhattan or even Philadelphia. And what's nice is that the university was founded first and the city of uh, Columbia has thus formed around the institution. So as you guys are walking around campus, you're still going to get all of the benefits of feeling like you're on a college's campus but also the added benefit of having a city right in your backyard with everything being in walking distance. Uh, as the state public flagship, we have over 27,000 undergraduate students. Uh, about 47% of that population make up our out of, is made up of out-of-state students. And fun fact, New Jersey is the second largest state that we recruit our out-of-state students from, um, with North Carolina being first, New York is third, and Pennsylvania is fourth. So we get a lot of students from the Northeast area coming down to Bleed Garden and Black, which is really exciting. Um, outside of that, we have over 100 different majors. Some of our most popular majors are gonna be housed in our Darlamore School of Business, our College of Nursing, our College of Engineering, and then within the College of Arts and Sciences, our Biology and Psychology majors are our top five most popular for out-of-state students. Outside of that, we have over 300 different minors, 19 Division I athletic programs, including men's uh, football and of course women's basketball if any of you had the, the opportunity to watch the basketball tournament um we're still we're a little upset about the final four but it was a great run and um all five of our uh seniors who came in in 2019 are all now officially drafted in the WNBA which is really exciting um including the number one overall draft pick Aliyah Boston um, outside of that, though, we also have a number of ranked, nationally ranked programs, including our number one international business program. We have the number one rated honors college in the nation amongst public institutions. Our honors college is ranked third amongst public and private. And we have the number one rated first year experience in the nation, which means that your freshman year is going to be chock full of amazing opportunities and experiences from tier one, from tier one research opportunities to free tickets to all of our football games to opportunities to rush our fraternities and sororities and everything in between. Um, it's a beautiful campus uh, from your area. You can fly direct either from Newark or Philadelphia through American Airlines to Columbia. We're about 20 minutes from the airport, which is fantastic. So getting to and from home is quite easy. And we do include transportation for students coming home to and from campus, which is great. But we'll offer tours five days a week um, over the summer. And we hope to see you on campus soon. Right. Thank you, everyone. So now we're going to get into the meat of it. Um, first, you all probably noticed that this is kind of a random collection of schools. Sorry, ladies. Um, but it is. So we've got kind of a group here because I want to represent to be able to represent to you different kinds of perspectives. So from smaller institutions to larger institutions, more specialized institutions, each of these six schools that are with us tonight um, received applications um, from Hillsborough High School this year. In fact, a total of 300 and 74 applications from Hillsborough. And even if I take out Rutgers, Suzanne, we're still at 116 applications spread across these other five schools. Um, every single one of these schools had a Hillsborough student enroll last year. Um, and I think to the best of my knowledge, every single one of them will have at least one student enroll this year as well, um, from what I'm hearing. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, and I don't know who wants to take it first. Someone can go. But does your school consider applications in a holistic way? And whoever is kind of good at explaining it, if you want to tackle what actually is holistic in for, um, admissions as well. I'll go ahead and start with that one. Um, so Lehigh does look at all of the applications in a holistic way. Being a mid-sized institution, um, we have about 14 to 15 counselors in our office, um, all designated certain territories, um, and we all each individually read our each individual application um, on a holistic level. And with that being said, I like to 
use holistic and compare it to um, a pizza um, in terms of the, the eight slices being even being cut the same size. So when we're looking at the application from a holistic perspective, what that means is we're looking at each part of the application as much as the other part. There is no certain part of the application that weighs higher than the other. They all have that equal piece in the pie um, that at the end of the day, we're asking ourselves with that application, when we get to the last page of it, is this student a good fit for Lehigh and is Lehigh a good fit for them? Uh, so when it comes to it, you're looking at grades, you're looking at curriculum, you're looking at the personal essay, you're looking at extracurriculars, um, you're looking at those recommendation letters, all of those things fall into play and each are looked at and weighted the same. Um, so really, again, that holistic piece um, is you're looking at the application as a whole. Um, you want to make sure that, you know, each of the students that we are bringing in um, are a whole piece of the puzzle in terms of academics, extracurriculars, what they're going to bring to our community. So really allowing each and every part of the application to weigh just the same as another part. And I'll kind of tack on to that too as well is part of the holistic review process as well at, at Gettysburg and um, many other institutions as well as, as we're looking that entire piece of the puzzle we we want to look at you in the context of where you are as well so we're looking at school profiles we're seeing how many you know, APs and honors are offered I think at Hillsborough you guys have like almost like almost 30 AP classes. Uh, so how many of those are you taking and how are you doing in those? So we're able to across an entire entire population that we're um, looking at in our application pool, you know, how are you doing in the context of where you are? And also what are you taking advantage of where you are? Um, so seeing what type of, um, you know, student you're going to be on our campus and how you're going to take, um, you know, how you're going to act on a intellectual playground that is a college or university that you'll be attending. I'm interested to hear also if any of you have particular things that maybe your institution is prioritizing when you are reviewing applications in 2023, 2022, 2024, kind of, you know, what's going on right now, because I think, um, you know, everybody knows some things have shifted after COVID. So where are we today? I'll jump in for a sec, because I think and I'm not going to speak for my colleagues here who are also at bigger schools, but one of the challenges when you're at a bigger place is that we can't exactly read holistically. Um, this past year, we're probably getting close to 88,000 applications and Rutgers is going to the Common App next year. We're going to jump even higher. So when we're looking at applications, while we'd like to see, we still ask for you to write an essay and your activities, the primary thing we're looking at at Rutgers and probably some other schools is, and first, everybody pretty much is going to be looking at your grades, the classes that you're taking, the levels of those classes, and the grades you're getting in those classes. So I was going to say transcript, but we actually have a self-reported academic record, so we're not looking at transcripts, but um, it really is, is that academic piece for us. That is the most important thing, and I think that you'll find that for any of us, the academic piece is the first. And if you can't really get past that, it doesn't matter how many activities or, you know, how wonderful a person you are, you, you just aren't going to get past that first swipe. For us highly, you know, highly selective places, a lot of people are qualified academically and then they're nitpicking and that's the holistic piece of it. Um, Rutgers has more room. So we're able to take more students and accept more students. We have room for about 7,000 first year students. So we're able to do it more on an academic basis. And Suzanne, just to uh, carry on with that, um, because as we, you know, as Rutgers being an in-state institution, um, as a the state public flagship for South Carolina, our review for out-of-state students is going to be viewed with a much more critical lens than our in-state students. Um, uh, to give you all an idea, we received over 46,000 applications this past year and 70, little over 75% of those applications came from out of state students. Um, but as the state flagship, we are required to maintain a higher in-state to out of state residency. So it makes the competitiveness for out of state students all the more 
challenging. Um, and so at, as Suzanne said, you know, for the University of South Carolina as well, we also are really only going to be focusing first and foremost on that transcript. For us, we focus primarily on core requirement classes, math, science, and English. Um, to those uh, three core subject areas have really allowed us to sort of, they have deemed success of students who have done well in those historically in high school, to those then being successful as students at U of SC um, before reviewing the rest of the transcript. And then if necessary, going into that more holistic review. Um, but as an out-of-state as an out-of-state student applying to at least South Carolina, I can't speak for my gal over at Purdue, um, it's going to be a little bit more challenging since we are still required to maintain that grades residency rate. So I would just like to add that, yes, um, while um, the most important factor is always the rigor of high school, I think we give a lot of weight to the balance there is between the extracurriculars or the kind of quality activities you have done with the rigor of high school. So yes, we do have the school profile. We are like, the, for the most part, looking at that and um, like what kind of, so I always like to say that it's really all about quality over quantity, whether it's for classes or whether it's for um, your activities, instead of being like part of like 15 clubs and being a member, 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 join like three, do something meaningful in them, give your, give it a lot of time, like raise it as your baby, like I say. And um, that's something that's more meaningful compared to like, same with your classes, um, having regular classes and getting A pluses in them, it's great. It's great for that trajectory. But if you are taking AP classes, if you're taking the rigorous courses and getting Bs, um, that's still better. Again, um, we want to see the challenge. We want to see that you can be a successful Purdue student if you can manage that kind of like a balance in your life as a high school student. And the other thing I would like to add is that starting 2023 fall semester, we will be going back to test required. So we are one of those institutions we have, we will be requiring that testing piece um, depending on the major it may be given more weight or less weight. So for example, most competitive majors, we really need it for them. So our engineering, computer science, professional flight, nursing, again, it will be a big factor for those majors. Some of the other majors that are not as competitive, it's still a required factor. So your application won't be picked up until that requirement is complete, but we do, do take super score. It does not matter whether you take the ACT, SAT, Really, it's um, a metric that we are going back to officially post COVID. So that's just new information that I would like to add for us. Yeah, and just to um, tie together kind of the smaller holistic review universities with the um, larger flagship universities that um, the academic evaluation is not us trying to like only take a certain echelon of students. It's to make sure that as a student, if you're accepted into our institution that you're being set up for success and not failure. So it's not, we're not trying to be critical in that way. We just wanna make sure that, you know, you are not gonna be floundering if you do come to our institution. Um, Rice does practice holistic review. We do value academic preparedness. We also value extracurriculars. And um, I'm sure for a lot of the other institutions represented tonight, um, we also like to see that there has been interest in us, um, whether that's displayed through the supplements. Um, in Rice's case, we have a number of questions asking about how you how rice fits into your picture of your future and i'm sure for some of my peers as well there is that factor as well that kind of led us into another thing that i'm getting some questions about and i know is coming up you know one of the biggest concerns that families have is around test optional admissions test blind um you know kind of the shift in testing post covid um can you talk about you know, what's going on in your school i know Zainab, uh, you know addressed it in terms of purdue um you know, and somebody else even asked more recently, like, how come schools just, you know, like, why bother going with test optional? Why not just go to test required or test blind? Why are we sitting in the middle? Who does that actually benefit? Can you kind of like talk about how that works and how students should know if it's helpful to submit their scores and where all the, who's making all these decisions anyway? Yeah, I can hop in here. Um, I'm not going to speak for my colleagues, but at Rice, um, we are test optional. We anticipate being test optional at least for the next few cycles. So hopefully for most of the students represented here tonight that we will be test optional when it comes to your application. Um, and the reason for this is because we recognize that 
COVID brought to light a lot of barriers to various access to test prep, to even be able to maybe physically go to a testing location. And we wanted to be inclusive of the students that maybe weren't able to have the same opportunities as students who have been in test prep since they were in sixth grade and have taken multiple practice tests. But we do also recognize that students who do have access to this kind of these kinds of resources um, might see a test score as a point of pride for them. And if they want to show it off, we want to give them the opportunity to do that. So the advice that we tend to give to students who are debating whether they should be, they should submit their test score or not, is if they feel like their test score and their transcript tell a similar story. Um, because we hope that, you know, if you're a high achieving student in the classroom, that you'll also reflect that in your test scores. And if there's a discrepancy that um, you maybe just didn't have a great test day or you had a really, really great test day, and that's explained. But um, it's more there to kind of reinforce or affirm the story that we're already being told in your transcript. I think very much like Sarah said, Lehigh is very much the same way. We are test optional um, for the foreseeable future. Um, we made that decision um, October of 2022, so last fall. Um, but very similar to what Sarah said, you know, ours is the same way. I always make the joke in our info sessions that if you feel, you know, again, if you feel that your transcript and your, you know, your testing um, are a true reflection of your academic readiness and you're super proud of that score, that's a great opportunity for you to submit it. Um, if you're like me and would rather have sat in a dentist chair than take a standardized test, um, there's your opportunity not to submit it. Um, you know, we get the questions all the time of, okay, well, what about the student that does submit their score? And what about the student that doesn't submit their score? Well, how do you compare them? And we can't. Um, as a holistic review um, application institution, um, again, that is something that we put our blinders on. Each application is right. It's given its due diligence um, and understanding, very similar to what Sarah said, you know, you're going to have different reasons as to why students are submitting their scores. You're going to have different reasons as to why students aren't submitting their scores. Um, so we, I know at Lehigh publicly have listed on our website what our 50th percentile in terms of a score is. Um, so giving you that range and that opportunity to kind of look at that, um, understanding that again, it's the 50th percentile, it is a range. So we do accept students lower than that range, obviously higher as well. So again, it's a conversation that, you know, you want to have with yourself, a conversation with your parents, your guidance counselors, and, you know, for us to reach out to us, ask us those questions. But I think Sarah put it pretty, pretty kind of nail on the head there um, as terms of Le what Lehigh does as well in terms of the test optional piece. Okay, I, don't, I think the only one here is going to test required next year is Purdue. I think everybody else, are you all nodding that you're all announced already for next year, at least that you'll be test optional. Okay. Just wanted to double check that I didn't miss anyone. Um, you know, in regards to test scores, I'm not sure if we covered this with everybody, but you know, if a student has, you know, how much, I guess, do they help or hurt? Um, if a student has kind of an average GPA and still, you know, they're, they're kind of, you know, midway on class, um, but they've got that 1560, 1570, um, but their GPA is kind of, for Hillsborough students, probably 94, 95, 96, something like that. You know, how much is that fantastic test score going to help them? You know, on the flip side, what if they've got you know, a 103 GPA and exceptional GPA and kind of average test scores or, or they don't submit them. You know, how much does that really affect? Um, I'll jump in for this one. Um, so the University of South Carolina is test optional. This is the third cycle that we, third or fourth, I can never keep track. I feel like COVID was 15 years ago. So like I can never like remember, but this is our next, another cycle where we are, we're going test optional. We did require test scores prior to the pandemic. And I think for us, and while I'm not, you know, in those meetings with our senior leadership, I think a lot of them are sort of looking at the trajectory of, you know, digital SAT and like what that is, but how that is also going to just change the landscape of higher education and testing in general. Um, but for us, and Katie from Lehigh kind of mentioned like that middle 50%. And I would advise students to really pay close attention to those middle 50% averages um, for each institution that you're looking at, even if it's, you know, making a list and kind of marking those down. Because 
my middle 50% for out of state is going to be different than Rice's middle 50% for out of state. And that's just the quality of like the applicants that we're getting and the acceptance rates and everything in between. Um, what I will say is that for us specifically, I tell students, if you are really proud of your test scores and you have fantastic scores well above or well above the middle 50% of our averages, submitting them, it would be in a positive factor, especially if you don't think academically, you maybe have like an off year or there's an off class, that sort of thing. But on the flip side of that, I caution students to submit scores, try not to fall into the trope of, well, they're test optional, but I feel like we should just submit scores anyway, because it'll help us. Because in some schools, it might hurt you. And there are situations where we have seen students who have applied at least to South Carolina, who have had great grades, 4.0 GPAs, but have submitted test scores to be considered as a test optional institution and had like a 1050 SAT or an 1100, and those students have been denied. So I, ex I explained to students that when you allow test scores to be a part of the conversation regarding admission into the university, that is your decision that you are making and therefore it is an equal consideration as a part of the overall application and the overall admission pool. So try to pay close attention to those middle 50% averages. Like Katie said, reach out to each of us. I mean, I can't, I know we can't tell you specifically like, yes, that score will get you into X school, but we can advise you based on our averages from last year that historically these test ha scores have gotten students accepted or vice versa. Um, but it is going to vary year to year based on the competitiveness of each class that every institution is getting in. Um, I also would caution students who are applying to schools that were test optional that are going back to requiring test scores to be cautious of those middle 50% because a lot of times those middle 50% will be broadcasted of students who did submit scores and therefore wanted their scores to, like, considered. So the averages are going to be very, very skewed heavily. So um, if you are looking at schools that, you know, say they're not here, but say Tennessee, for example, my good pal Cheryl, who works for the University of Tennessee, you know, don't pay attention to those middle 50% because those are going to be very obscure numbers versus how they had to review students this year from the senior class as a completely requiring test scores institution again. So pay close attention to that as well as you see certain schools maybe go back to or revert back to their testing required policy moving forward. That's a great tip, Samantha. And I'm also really glad you kind of highlighted that difference between in-state and out-of-state. And that is definitely something that is really key um, is to remember that as state institutions, their first job is to service the students that are in their state. And so admission standards may look different for in-state or out-of-state students. That, that said, in some states, they really have a target of building up their out-of-state um, population. And sometimes, um, you know, they're, they're really eager to admit out-of-state students, but it really depends. And, you know, part of what we do as counselors, and I work with students throughout as well, is to help them understand which schools are going to be, you know, perhaps more selective for them as an out-of-state student where, you know, like, hey, don't get fooled by those numbers because it's different for out-of-state. So, you know, particularly with a lot of the large publics on the East Coast, I would definitely recommend seeing if there is any statistics available around mid 50% and criteria specific to out of state um, students. Some of them do publish some great ones. I've seen some on the South Carolina site. Georgia Tech publishes great ones. There's other schools out there that do as well. Make sure you're really paying attention to that because it's important. Oh, go ahead, Suzanne. Yeah, I just want to jump in and say the other, you know, for any of us, you can probably Google. Rutgers profile, and that'll bring up the, the mid 50%. For Rutgers, because we admit by college, you also have to pay attention to the colleges because it varies. Um, so that's another thing as you're applying to schools that have more colleges. Um, as I've mentioned, you know, some of the more selective majors may have different uh, mid 50%. And um, yeah, so those are, I would say, look, keep looking at those numbers, though, you know, the mid 50% is as Sam said, those are important numbers. Profile, it's profile, that's what it's called. Yes, and I'll often Google um, something like Rutgers mid 50% SAT, and that'll usually get me close. It's usually like top five links that you're looking at. If you if you Google Purdue mid 50% SAT, it's probably gonna be in the first couple um, that come hey, up when you're there. 
pay attention at Rutgers to New Brunswick, Camden, and Newark. Yes, too. <laughs> the New Brunswick site tends to default when you Google Rutgers, it does tend to default to the Camden view. So make sure you're being careful and looking for New Brunswick if that's the campus that you're focusing on for sure. All right, I feel like first. Ah, that's yeah. So that's why it defaults. Okay, I feel like we've beaten the testing horse a little bit, but so now the bulk of our questions are leading to the, the next horse, which is GPA and test scores or GPA and grades. Um, so tell us a little bit about how your school reads our transcripts, or in the case of Suzanne, our grades, since we self-report for you all. Um, for those that haven't looked at us in a minute, we use a 100-point scale. Um, for our courses, um, we provide a weighted and an unweighted GPA. When calculating our weighted GPA, we weight college prep, honors, AP, and dual enrollment courses. So almost everything is weighted. So it's a little fluffy, if you will. Um, do you use this GPA as it is? Do you recalculate it? Do you even care about the GPA? Do you care about the courses? How does all of that work at your school? And that'll take care of about half the questions in the queue. <laughs> um, I can jump in for Rice. So Rice is a host of university. We will see all of the information that um, is sent to us. So we will see unweighted, we will see weighted. Um, we also receive a school profile, which showcases the different offerings um, in the courses and the extracurriculars. And um, the transcript and the school profile together help us paint a picture of how you challenged yourself as a student and how your performance fares kind of in the larger context of your graduating class. So that is primarily what we're looking at in academics, that we want to see that you've taken challenging courses. We want to see that you've excelled in those challenging courses because for Rice, um, we are a very rigorous institution. And as I mentioned before, we want to make sure that you're setting yourself up for success if we do admit you. So I'll follow basically. And um, yeah, so we're a holistic review um, university as well. And like I've said previously, um, I, I, what I, when I tell students like in person, we don't really look at the GPA, I, to be honest. Like when I'm re reviewing an application, I'm not looking at the GPA. I'm looking at everything but the GPA. <laughs> But I feel like the GPA is really for students and parents to compare with other schools to see what kind of institutions they are trying to apply and what kind of like rigor there is at those institutions. It's really for us, like when students ask like weighted, unweighted, really, we don't care, like submit a GPA. It's really what your transcript is saying about you is what I'm looking for. Um, Again, the upward trajectory is what I like to look for in students applying to some of the rigorous curriculums. I, especially coming out of COVID, I know there are still a lot of COVID related um, deficiencies that are there in many of the school systems. And we definitely take those into account. So the school profile, just like Sarah said, with the transcript is probably the most important piece. It's probably the most like the first piece we look at, we look for in an application and everything else follows. Being a holistic um, school, basically, it does have its challenges. Like there are variations of courses and grades we're looking for. And then it's a tough balance with other things they're bringing to the table as well. So if they've taken two to three years of a language or they have done like some sort of technical um, diploma with it, or they've done an internship, they've done research, like things that normal students really have to go out and dig for and find. That's something we take into account that you're doing like an equal part in both sides of your life. So, and just like that, if you have family responsibilities, it, it's going to give, be given a lot of weight when you have those things, you have to take care of sibling, you have a second job or something, and you're still getting those high grades in the most rigorous courses offered at your school. Um, so it's a, it really is a complete balance. So therefore GPA does not seem like the most like, you know, proper way to judge a student on their like performance, really the transcript. And we do take self-reported scores as well. So that ends up being the most important part. The GPA really is for you to compare with other schools for Purdue at least, yeah. 
I'll hop into as another holistic review school here as well. Um, I mean, I'll definitely echo Zaina. We're definitely looking at you in the context of where you are and that we're, we're looking at the courses that you're taking. So how many APs, how many honors, how many college preps and how you're doing in those in the context of where you are. So at Gettysburg, we generally see A's and B's in the challenging courses that are offered at your school. So, you know, you guys are offered a, a lot of opportunities to explore those higher level courses at Hillsboro. So you definitely want to see that you're taking advantage of some of those while you're there. Uh, and we're also looking to see, are you completing some of our requirements for, for admissions as well in regarding the transcripts? Like, are you completing two years of a language? Are you taking a math in your senior year? So there's certain things that we look for in the context in that transcript. Um, um, so we're, that's generally where our eyes are going to dart first before we're looking at GPA. Awesome. That really did take care of about half the questions in there. Um, and then kind of related, how does course rigor come into play? Um, and what does the transcript look like for a typical student that is admitted from our region of the country in terms of the course rigor that they have at your institution? Um, you know, what are your expectations around what you're going to see in the senior year? The age old question, is it better to have all A's and CP's or to take something more advanced to get something lower? Is one grade going to blow up my entire, all of my chances of getting admitted to your school? Um, you know, certain subjects you care about, don't care about. Is there, are there academic subjects you don't care about, um, et cetera? So, I'll jump in really quick because I forgot to mention a piece earlier. Um, for some of the most rigorous majors, really everything is kind of set in stone. So you do really have to be perfect in everything. So computer science, engineering, um, professional flight. So for this area, for this region, the heaviest um, interest is always in computer science and engineering. I don't think I've seen more applications for any other major than I've seen for these two majors. And there is really a certain criteria that you have to be a perfect student. And in the end, you still might not be able to get a spot because of limited spaces and everything being hands-on learning. So we only accept as many students that we can give those opportunities to. So based on that, for engineering, computer science, um, usually when I was visiting the college fair, there was a lot of interest from Hillsborough. And I just had to say that really, the like we want you to take as many AP classes you possibly can like <laughs> you can survive with like a full load of AP please do take it um, A's and B's again in those we are looking for highest levels of maths and sciences offered at your school and seek out opportunities for research I know not a lot of schools are offering those um, for those things many of times students have to like pursue other avenues from their parents colleagues or just seek out themselves and research. So those are some of the biggest things we're looking for. And it's it's a big, like, I guess, straight line that you have to have like a certain everything to get admitted to those majors. But for everything else, it's a very um, generic system. You can, If you have a choice of you taking AP classes, please do. High levels of math and sciences generally looks for looks good for our our level of schools that have more rigorous curriculums. So if you have something like linear algebra, if you have AP calcs, BC calcs, things like that, take those. And even if you're performing like with Bs and Cs, please do not hesitate to submit an application because that will speak volumes overall. Can, can I jump in? Like many conversations when you ask a panel of admissions folks what the answer is it's going to be it depends and you know I'm just thinking at even Rutgers it depends on the program that you're applying to so so much depends and while you know absolutely you know if you have your heart set on a flight program at Purdue you better be taking those that calculus and physics um I think that all of us would also agree though that your college choices in your list should emerge from who you are in high school. So try not to create your, your high school classes or your choosing your classes based on what you think we want. Like let, let it emerge. I, I, 
I feel very strongly about, you know, students' mental health, and I don't think that encouraging every student to say, you know, you must take all honors and AP courses is the right pathway for every student, and it doesn't mean that you won't get into all of our schools either. Um, if you choose to not take foreign language your senior year because that's not your thing and you want to double up on science, okay. If you want to double up on, on history and not take a science, that might be okay, depending on your major. So it so much depends and, and try to be who you are and let the, this process emerge from that a little bit. I, I don't want to, you know, say, well, you know, at Rutgers, sure, we have specific programs. If you're in engineering, you have to take physics. If you're, you know, <laughs> there, there are certain requirements, but there are other ways to do all of this. And, and I just want to make sure that, that people understand that, you don't have to be a straight AP, you know, 1600 student at Hillsborough to get into college. There are lots of choices. I think to go off Suzanne, I think, again, it depends, but I also think the biggest thing we want to see is growth. Um, I think being able to see improvement from year to year is important. Um, again, we all know everyone went through a COVID year, um, different students, you know, reacted to that and were able to be okay with remote learning. Some students weren't. So understanding that, you know, the growth periods from year to year are really important too. Um, I think just being able to see that you are putting in the effort, putting in the work to be able to grow as a student and grow as an individual. So again, you might not be taking all those AP classes, but if you're, you know, take two AP classes your senior or your junior year and take three AP classes your senior year, like that's great growth and be able to see that. So again, being able to challenge yourself to the best of your ability to what's available to you is really important because again, high schools are going to have different opportunities and different uh, classes available to them. So again, putting yourself in the shoes of yourself and being able to challenge of what's available to you in context is really, really important. Yeah, um, piggybacking off of that, um, shoot, I just lost my train of thought. I did have one tidbit that I just wanted to share that's more whimsical and fun than anything else. Um, in our office, our conversation um, observing the trends of the last two years is that a lot of students have been getting B's and AP lit across New Jersey. And we don't know what the reasoning is behind that, but we notice these trends and we see them and we are aware when we're reading applications that this is something that is maybe out of the control of each individual student. Oh, I got my other thought. So it's related. Um, because COVID happened and because just in general, especially for holistic review universities, we want to know what's going on behind just kind of the typical transcript numbers that we see. Um, we know that there are students whose mental health was impacted. We know students who have lost family members. And um, we know students that maybe had some scheduling issues in trying to get classes that they wanted. So if this situation fits you, we encourage you to tell us about it because um, if you don't tell us about it, then we might think, oh, they just didn't want to challenge themselves when there is a very real and valid reason that you might not be taking a certain number of courses. So share with us this information, especially if you feel like it impacts um, the choices that you were able to make. Awesome. And let's move on a little bit away from kind of some of the, the number of things and into kind of like the rest of the application and extracurricular activities. Um, sometimes I feel like people are trying to kind of like think that there's a list and you're trying to check all of the boxes like oh, volunteer experience, check, after school job, check, sport, check, leadership, check. Um, you know, how does that really work? Uh, you know, are there certain things that are really big difference makers for students? Um, what do you want to see students doing in the summer months? Um, and also, like, what if there are a student who just really hasn't found their place? I do feel like, you know, th this group that uh, the bulk of these juniors, you know, they had that COVID land kind of the first part of their high school. And I feel like some people kind of kind of sputtered on getting involved. You know, they really struggled to get involved when they were at home, kind of came back. You know what I mean? And really had a hard time kind of re-engaging and getting involved. Um, what about those students that are kind of lacking in extracurricular life? <laughs> um, I'll jump in for this one. I think because, and again, it's the age old, it's going to depend on each institution and how we review. But generally speaking, I would not 
I would encourage students to not be so hard on themselves when it comes to writing out that activities list on the Common App or submitting a resume because, and I can't speak for everybody, but activities don't necessarily end when you go home from your high school day. And it's not an activity, even if it's not something that you're doing in correlation with your high school. If it's something that's taking up time away from your life, that is not homework and studying and doing well in school, that's an activity. An activity can be that you are required to babysit younger siblings while, you know, your mom and dad are working, right? And making sure that, you know, dinner is prepared and that they're getting themselves together and you have to pick them up from school. An activity can be that you are taking care of an elderly grandparent. It can be that you, you know, have to work like a part-time job, right? It is not, if, if you are not the captain of the varsity lacrosse team, it is okay, you know, because not everybody is going to do that. I think what an activities list really allows for us to see is how you spend your time outside of academics in high school. We see from the transcript, the rigor of the classes that you're taking and how well you're doing in those classes. We see, okay, based on those grades, Sally is doing really well and she's obviously putting in like a lot of work to do really well in high school. What does she do outside of that? And we totally understand that with COVID, there are going to be a gap. There is going to be like not as much consistency as you normally would. And it's always, you know, there's an opportunity on the Common App to talk about like the COVID disruption. And so if there was like a major disruption in your life, but we know that. Remember that we all also live through COVID. So we totally understand that, you know, your lives as like freshmen going into what would look a little different, right? And I also think, and again, I can't speak for all of my colleagues on the panel, that quality is much better than quantity and that we would rather see, even if it's two activities that you spend all of your time outside of school working on is much better than having 10 activities where you just go up to a club and also it's the time that you put in, right? Five clubs where you're dedicating four to five hours each week, et cetera, to those organizations are going to look better than 15 different clubs where you spend like an hour, maybe like two every other week, maybe once a month you meet, that sort of thing. So don't stress so much about the activities because it really does come into that whole holistic review process and allows us to see what you do. And it just allows us as counselors to really see what you like to do and what your responsibilities are outside of waking up and going to school every day. And I will build off that basically, again, two different sets of things that we look for. Again, for the competitive majors, we would like to see like a lot more quality and more time spent on activity sections as well. But overall, um, it doesn't have to be related to engineering. If you're applying to engineering, it doesn't have to be related to computer science. Like I saw a lot of um, robotics. I felt like I was literally seeing different applications with different names, but the activity sections was the same for most of the students. And it started to bother me at one point <laughs> that why is everyone doing robotics and nothing else? So like my one anecdote for this is, um, this is the one area you get to really show what your passions are. Like academics, we know that there are certain criteria you have to met for different, depending on the majors you're applying to different schools. Like activity sections where you can really wanna show your passion for something. If it's environmental, causes please even if it's like two hours you spend every week cleaning up something talk about it if it's taking care of a family member like samantha said sibling duties after covid without covid covid was the reason or not talk about it there are students that talk about like making lunch every day and i have a lot of respect for them <laughs> so yes please talk about those things and yes don't think that these things are yeah you don't have to fill like a certain criteria or certain like the like words over here on the activity sections, the nominal things you do in your life that make you who you are and the passion that you have for those things, that's really what we're looking for. So think of this part as really like your interview with us on a piece of paper and let us know who you are as a person. And I feel like this activity section is a great way and place where you can be yourself. And same thing goes for the essay as well, but we're getting to that. So I would want to talk about that. <laughs>
drives us into the next question. You said the magic word about essay. Um, and our juniors are like getting close to the part of the year in English where they're going to be sort of working on their essays. And some of them have started already, or um, some of them will be holding off until after AP exams. Um, but can you tell me like from your perspective, you know, um, what makes an essay memorable? Um, are there things you'd like to read about or things that you find really aren't so helpful for the student and you don't like to read about? Um, give me, give them some tips, I guess, um, as they enter this difficult part of essay writing. And I know this is all students' favorite part of the application because it's the only thing you really have to play. It's not black and white. So uh, I always ask that question. It's like, how's it? application going how's your personal essay going and they're like we hate it um but my biggest thing I always say two different I always say two really key pieces the biggest thing is to make sure you're answering the prompts um it is amazing how many personal essays that I have read that have nothing to do with the prompt so make sure that is important but my piece of advice is I want to learn something new about you through your personal essay I think being able to express yourself in a way, again, whether it's your passion, something that is, you know, something that's not anywhere else in your application that I can learn something about you. You know, most of us, again, some of us are reading every single application, some of us aren't, but understanding that we are not going to be face to face with every single application that we get. So this is the opportunity for us as we read, to be able to paint the picture of who you are, what matters most to you. So being able to use the personal essay as a form of, okay, this is what's really important to me. This is something I want my admissions counselor to know. This is something that I want Lehigh University, any other university to know about me. Um, and I think the biggest thing with that is you're all going to have different types of writing styles. Um, and the, us as readers are all going to have different types of essays that we like to read. Um, you know, there's counselors in our office that really like the creative portions of it. There's, you know, counselors in our office that like the straightforward, you know, give me a story type of situation. So again, I think it's really, again, how you present it is up to you, but understanding and making sure you answer the prompts um, and really just allowing me as, as the application reader or anyone, you know, that is, that is getting that opportunity to read that essay, to be able to come away with it and be like, okay, this is what this student is about. This is what matters to them. This is what they're passionate about, or to come away with that and be like, okay, I learned something that I would not have known without this personal essay being in their application. So again, making it your own, being true and dedicated to yourself um, is really important too, because the amount of essays I've also read that seem to be dramatic and a little stretched um, just to impress ourselves, that's not something we're looking for. So again, making sure that you're being true to who you are and letting us paint a picture of you is really important. And I'm just going to jump in there because I love talking about the college essay and I promise I won't talk very long. I tell students all the time the 80-20 rule. When it comes to writing a college essay, regardless of what the prompt is, 20% of your essay should be setting up the story, setting up the prompt. 80% is telling us what you learned from that particular incident, situation, life-changing event, relationship that you have, lost, whatever it may be. 80% needs to be what you learned from that and how you hope to bring those lessons with you to college. If you, and I use this all the time, because this is, I, and if you write your college essay about why your grandfather is your hero, do not write an essay and tell me all about how amazing your grandfather is. Because as much as I loved reading about it, he is not the one who is going to college. You are. So it's, and I see it a lot where like the essay will start and the student, and it's not just that, it's, you know, how the student got hurt for, on the season opener for your soccer game and, you know, is missing the senior season. And we'll get the long story of like what happened and the very last, like the two last lines are going to be. And this is what I took away from it. And I'm like, oh my God, like, no. So think about, and I always tell students, 80-20, 20% needs to be what you, what happened to you, what you want to talk about. 80% should be focused on the lessons you learned and how you hope to apply those 
in your future and how you hope to take those lessons and achieve better in college. I am definitely stealing that, Samantha. <laughs> this exactly. 80-20 rule. Yeah. I also want to say too, in that also tell a story that that you want to tell. Don't tell a story you think we want to hear. I feel like we get a lot of essays where it's like they're definitely trying to make themselves sound like they are already a student on our campus. We want us. We want to hear what who you are. That's the opportunity to do it. So that is one tidbit I would really recommend students do is really to stay true to yourself with it and and tell the story that you want to. Um, So I think we've all really touched on that, but I'm going to echo it too. (laughs) And then also we also, I saw a lot of this um, this year is I feel like a lot of students were trying to smush everything into 650 words. You don't have to you don't have to smush uh, you know we've got we've got your extracurriculars we have your transcript we have a really good picture of everything that you're doing this is the time for you to really show off your writing skills and show off who you are and your voice um so yeah no smushing if i can echo that <laughs> I also add, we're seeing, and I I hear this from my counterparts everywhere, we're seeing an awful lot of these trauma essays. Um, And I think part of it is because, and I love to read the New York Times best essays, just like everybody else, because they're fascinating and they're really amazing kids. But sometimes choosing a topic doesn't have to be something that was so life altering. Some of the best essays that I can think of are things like a student who wrote about their nickname or, you know, things that were really meant something to them. Even if, if I don't care if it's why the sky is blue and the grass is green, if it's something you're passionate about, but the idea that it has to be something that's traumatic. Um, somebody mentioned D I, I, I tell students to try to stay away from D words, death, disease, divorce, drama, you know, whatever, um, depression, you can, if you, if that's part of who you are, there are other opportunities to do that. Uh, Even on the common application, there's additional essay, uh, additional writing that you can choose. Sometimes you have to write that, but sometimes you can use that for a couple sentences that might explain something about your application, but don't let all those things define you. There are so many other things that you could write about that are so much more fun to write about So if you're having trouble writing something because it's making you depressed and it's really just not working, it's probably not the right topic. These aren't easy because they're self-reflective, but they shouldn't be so hard because it's all about you. So I I love what Katie said. Tell us something we, you know, you want to tell us or somebody said that, Sam, you know, but also, you know, tell us, tell us something that's, that's something that is maybe even fun. That's okay. A couple of great pieces of advice that I've heard, you know, one, um, when we're talking about some of those trauma essays, sometimes I feel like it is something a student needs to write, but needing to write it and needing to submit it are two different things. Sometimes you need to get those things down. And sometimes students will do that in their, in their junior English, you know, sometimes that comes out, you know, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be your final essay. Sometimes the act of getting that out is really enough. And in doing that, you kind of realize, you know what, I, I don't need this to make it all about this. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the student is able to take some of that information and kind of condense it and put it in an additional information section um, where it could be a little bit more factual. I mean, and they can put it in there or sometimes they opt to leave things out entirely. Um, and another kind of good tip I got from, a, you know, a, a rep a couple of years ago was sort of the lunch table test. If you've written an essay um, and you leave it behind on the lunch table after you're left, like, would your friends have any clue which person it belonged to? If the answer is it could have belonged to any of the 10 people at the round table in the HHS Commons, then that essay is super dramatic, super general rather, and it's really not doing you any favors. Um, and, you know, think about what you could write about that's more personal to you. And I really encourage students to look at some of the college essay guy resources. They're great in helping you kind of identify what's important to you. And also some of the best, you know, essays I've read have been about, you know, kind of really generic things that are maybe important to a student, maybe about like their childhood doll or their bracelet. I've, I've read about great things and they tie them into other parts of them that are really important, perhaps family, their past, other things about them where it really allows the reader to get a much better view of who the student is as a person and what kind, what they're adding 
what kind of human they are adding to their campus. And I think that that is, is super important. And, you know, as you juniors, as you're working on these in class, you know, my hope for you, you know, I would love for you to come out of, of junior English with a an essay that kind of resembles what might be your final piece. That, that's great for you if you are able to do that. Um, some people aren't able to do that. So my next best hope for you is that in writing it, Sometimes we get to the point that we're so far in and it's due in two days and now we just need to finish it for a grade. And I get that. And that's reality, especially in, in spring at this point. Um, but my hope is that you absorb enough from the process that you have more direction for what you need to do when you start over um, and you are able to kind of get there. And I definitely do not recommend leaving that until the start of senior year. Um, but I do recommend when school is out, not sitting down on June 23rd to try to knock that out. Give yourself a little bit of breathing room um, and then start on that maybe a little bit later in the summer um, and try to come up with something a little bit so that you've got the time and you're not really stressing yourself out with yet another deadline, which is probably what's gonna be stressing you, you out soon when you know Trav or Kukra or whoever it is is telling you like, hey, your final essay is due in like three days and now you're freaking out and writing some kind of piece of garbage a little bit just to hand it in. Um, but you know, don't do that to yourself again so that on October 26th, you're in the same place. So give yourself the time to kind of go from there. A um, couple of quick, quick hit questions. Thumbs up or down, do your schools interview? Okay, for my friends that do interview, I think it's optional at all of your schools. What are, you know? What role does that interview play in that process? I love our interview process. Only I'm biased because so at Lehigh we actually have our current Lehigh students um, do the interviews, um, which I think gives the opportunity for our prospective students to get a different outlook on if a admissions counselor were doing the interview. Um, we are, they are optional. Um, what happens is the student that is doing the interview will write some notes during the interview. Um, they'll create a write-up um, and it will be attached to the prospective student's file. Um, I will tell you there has never been in my tenure at Lehigh um, an interview that has completely swayed a decision, um, but there are some interviews that have added some question marks. Um, but again, I think for for a, an opportunity at Lehigh, again, it being optional, I highly advise our students to do it um, just because it gives you that opportunity to sit one-on-one -on -one with a current student who is living the life day-to-day. -day. They're going to be able to answer those day-to-day -day questions better than I could any day of the week. Um, so I think being able to have those interviews is important. Um, you know, there's obviously some really good interviews and we love them. Um, and there's some not so good interviews. Um, and I think we have established with our students that do the interviews that we are trusting them to give us the best feedback possible. Um, because again, we let them know, like, these are students that we are going to bring into the Lehigh community that are going to be a part of your community. So we want you as a prospective student coming into interview to be you. I know we keep preaching that, but I think that is so important to understand that, again, we don't want you coming into this interview, putting on a facade and then finding out later on that that's not who you are. Um, it's very much conversational. It's not, you know, straightforward, you know, question by question by question. It's more of that opportunity for our students to get to know you, but then you to also get to know a Lehigh student. They're going to become a point of contact. They're going to write you a thank you note. You're going to get their email address. You're going to be able to ask them those personal questions about academics, about campus life, about internships, research opportunities, things like that. So really being able to do it is more about finding out those pieces of information that are going to allow you to walk away from it. Asking yourself that question, you know, is Lehigh a place for me to be? Um, so again, it is optional, but I always highly advise students to, to take up that option. Yeah, I just want to reemphasize um, for Rice as well, and I'm sure for a lot of other universities that conduct interviews that um, we know that there's a, you can feel a lot of pressure going into interviews to be perfect, to be polished, to give the exact right answer. It really is a conversation and it's as much of a benefit for us to hear 
what your what your interviewer thought of you as it is for you to hear your interviewer's experience. We have student interviewers, we have alumni interviewers. Every once in a while, if someone can't make theirs, um, one of us admission counselors will step in. And um, it is as much for us to see like, okay, this is what they're like behind the application as it is for you to ask like, what was your experience at Rice? What is your impression of the community? Um, and use that information to ultimately make your decision. I'll talk a little bit too about our interview process since it's a little bit different since you're always interviewing with an admissions counselor for us so if for us it's really an opportunity to get to know you even better just like um, our other colleagues said here on this call um, you know it gives you an opportunity to ask us questions about you know the application process and, and how life is on campus too um, but I can't tell you how excited I get when we're reading application and I come across a student who I've interviewed it's like oh my gosh you know we can talk so much about you know this like one event that they did you know how much they loved fishing or something like that you know it's an opportunity for us to really get to know the why behind you're interested in certain things so we'll talk about things you like to do for fun as well as things that you might be interested in pursuing academically but also you know what's on your mind what questions do you have about Gettysburg that we can answer for you so it's a very conversation based we're not going to ask you the hard questions like what's your greatest weakness or anything we really want the opportunity to get the note to know you and we want the opportunity we want you to have the opportunity to get to know us as well well, so I just wanted to put that in there too. I think that's a great point, and that's you know pretty consistent with my own experience as well. Having been on the other side of the desk, done interviews, and now been on this side of the desk, no one is trying to trip you up um, and make you fall flat on your face. And I would consider that if you feel like that, that is maybe you get an alumni interviewer or something, and you feel like that's what they're trying to do, remind yourself that that says a lot more about them than it does about you. Um, and kind of take that with a grain of salt. And that could be good feedback to, to give. It could say something about that institution, um, but kind of do with it what you want, but then put it out of your mind because it's really not about you if that's what you feel like is going on. Um, it's 7.48, so we're kind of going to start to wrap a little bit. So I wanted to go with, I think what will be probably be, wind up being our last um, question here, and I'll let you guys choose and each of you answer. Either, you know, what's some of your best examples of what stands out in an application or, you know, some best tips about going through this process? Either one, I don't care. <laughs> I can start off. I think one thing that I would really recommend and one thing that stands out to me when reading essays, or sorry, when reading applications, essays included in that is if every different piece of that puzzle is adding something new. You know, this is really the snapshot of you. And if, we're, if we don't have the opportunity to interview with you, this is what your this is our picture of you. So in every different um, piece of the application, extracurriculars and you know, personal statement, if you're able to put in um, a community disruption or anything, you know, that's going to give us a huge snapshot of you and your letters of recommendation as well. Um, so that's what I would recommend is try to add something new in every piece so we get that entire holistic picture of, of you, the applicant. Um, I have two bits of advice for students, especially juniors who are going just about to start this process. Um, have a very candid and open conversation with your family um, about what expectations are in terms of financial assistance to help you get to college. I know we didn't talk about it tonight, um, but I think it is something that's important to just mention because um, obviously financial fit is just as important of a conversation to have as is academic and social fit for a university. And it's better for families to sort of have an understanding now prior to going into the application process um, about what schools are reach schools financially, right? That, you know, are only accessible if, you know, a student receives X amount of scholarship or grant money or whatever it may be. Um, and it's important to have those open and honest conversations now rather than this time next year, um, which is going to be a much tougher conversation to have. So that's always my bit of advice as all of us as admissions reps are dealing with yield and answering a lot of questions about merit scholarship, financial aid, and all of that. I always like to just advise my families. My other bit of advice is more fun, hopefully. We are not scary people. Remember, we all went through the college process before. We all know what this is like, and we've been doing this for a while. Talk to us. We are happy to answer your questions. 
There is nothing wrong with sending us an email uh, with questions. You, I have worked with students who are, were juniors last year that are now seniors going to South Carolina this year, right? Like, talk to us, email us. We are here to help you guide and guide you through our own admissions pro like policies and practices while also here to give you advice on the process you're never going to bug us. No question is too silly or too simple. We have heard everything. Believe me, we've been doing it. We, we've heard it all. There is no question. It's too ridiculous because I guarantee you, we probably all have a story of something that's just absolutely bananas. And it wouldn't be coming from Hillsboro because you have a fantastic college counseling staff that know how to go through this process. Um, we got you, but like, just enjoy this process. Enjoy it. It's scary, but don't be afraid to talk to us and ask us questions because that's what we're here to do. And we love to talk. And if they don't want to talk to you again, consider that the experience that you're having as a prospective student is probably a very good experience indication as to the experience that you will have when you are a current student at the institution. This is the time that you are trying to earn your way in, but they are also trying to recruit you and put their best foot forward. And if that is their best foot, think about what you're paying for. And I will just like to have my two advices out. Um, genuineness and inten intentionality for every part of your application is big. Um, stay true to the whole process. And I know this is hard to understand from the student's point of view, there's no such thing as a perfect school. Um, we're all great schools. You all, you always like, like, this is as much as us choosing the candidates for our schools and as much as you choosing a good fit for yourself. So always focus on what's a great fit for you and your four years because of the time, the investment, the money you're spending on this whole process. Um, you, wanna, you wanna remember your college experience as something great years later not something that you want to have a lot of regrets about. So anything and everything um, about it should be intentional. Um, yeah, so I know there are a lot of students who have like their first pick, second picks. So it's like, I need to get into my first choice school. It's a lot more than that. You will live even if you don't get into your first choice school and you will still be going to a great school. So do not make this all about it. Uh, find a good fit for yourself always. I think going off that is, you know, very similar. I think, you know, my best piece of advice is understanding that this is your application. Mm -hmm. So this is your opportunity to humbly brag about yourself. You know, we want all the information about you because this is, this is your one time to tell us everything you need um, in terms of why you feel that, you know, this institution is going to be the best fit for you and why we're a great fit for yourself as well. Um, I think the biggest thing too is understand that this journey is going to be different for every single person, that you do not need to compare yourself to your best friend, to the person down the street. Like this journey is your journey. Um, social media plays a huge impact in that. And I can go on my soapbox about social media with all of this, um, having been a former college basketball coach and, you know, all the social media trends, but please, please, please understand that this is your journey. And it is about finding your home for the next four years. And that's exactly what it is. It's your home away from home. So being able to find that social fit, that academic fit, that financial fit, those are all really key pieces to figuring it out. So understanding that, you know, just because someone down the street's going to another school and you're going to this school, it's, it's all about you. So, you know, asking those questions, doing your research is really, really important. My advice is going to lead right from that. And that is to be open-minded because right now who you are, and some of you are even freshmen or be, you know, even the juniors, who you are right now is not who you're going to be next May. And it's not who you're going to be in three years. So please just be open-minded about the process. You could change your mind completely about what you want, what you think is important in your college, and you probably will. And most of the parents out there will probably say, you know, you're going to change majors, you're going to change your mind. It's it, just be open-minded to the, the different opportunities and options because things are going to change. I think we hit everyone and we are right on time. I told you no later than eight. It is 7.56. I want to say thank you so much to our guests um, for helping us out and answering so many questions tonight. 
Um, a quick reminder to our juniors that you all received a Google invite pass from me today. Starting tomorrow, I will be doing junior groups. I'm going to try to make it a little bit fun. We're going to be playing a little game, answering some questions. And there are some things, some words and buzzwords that came out tonight that might help your performance in those games. Um, please do go to your classes first before you come and show up to me. If you have a test, a quiz, a graded assignment that is counting for third marking period, Period, you should be staying in class and doing that. And I will catch you in makeup groups next week. Um, and don't, you know, don't stress on missing it. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing all you students with probably some more questions after, you know, tonight's program um, over the next couple of days. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a great night.